Hi there everyone, and welcome to my Betaflight 4.5 Tuning Masterclass. The goal of this video is to take you from being maybe not all that familiar with how to tune a quad, to being an absolute tuning expert, knowledgeable about every setting, and able to get a perfect tune on any quad. It's a lot to cover, so today we're going to start by looking at filters, which is the foundation of a great tune in Betaflight. In following videos, we're going to be looking at pitch tuning to get a quad that is super stable and super responsive in the air. And finally, looking at tuning your rates to get that perfect stick feel. You're going to want to watch each of these videos in order because they build on each other. So make sure you like this video, subscribe to the channel, and hit that notification bell so that you see each of these videos as they come out and you can follow along with me as we learn how to tune Betaflight 4.5 to perfection. Before we dive into this guide, I want to do a quick review of black box logging to make sure that you've got the right settings and that you can open and look at the logs correctly. Black box logging is not required for every part of this guide, but it does help, particularly with some of the more advanced sections. So if you have the capability, it's worth using it. For the logging device, you're going to want to set the logging device in the black box tab to either onboard flash, if your flight controller has an onboard flash chip, or SD card, if it has an SD card slot. The minimum logging rate for black box should be at least one kilohertz because you're only going to see frequencies up to half the sample rate. So if you set it to 1K, you'll see signals up to 500 hertz. I would say the ideal logging rate is either 1.6K or 2K, depending on the type of gyro you have on your flight controller. That's going to give you plenty of detail. It's going to give you signals up to 800 or 1000 hertz. And it's also not going to fill up your black box chip too fast. So you'll be able, going to be able to do several flights before your chip fills up. And that's really important. If you set it to 4K or 8K, you don't get that much extra useful information, but you do fill up the log really, really fast. And then you can't, um, then you have to clear it and transfer it onto a laptop or whatever. Clear your onboard data flash chip if you need to before you start doing filter tuning. Often it can be full up. So you just want to clear it and make sure that you're collecting fresh data. And in Betaflight 4.5, the raw gyro data is now always logged, no matter what debug mode you set in the black box. So you can just set any debug mode you want or leave it to none. You're going to get that raw gyro data all the time, which is what we need for our filter tuning. When it comes time to look at the logs that you've collected, you're just gonna go into the black box tab in Betaflight Configurator and hit activate mass storage device mode. After a few seconds, a window is going to pop up with all of the logs as if they were on a memory stick on your computer, and you can just open one of them. So I'm going to open log number four. This will take a few seconds to open in Blackbox Explorer. If you don't have Blackbox Explorer, there's a link to where you can download the latest version down in the video description. Once the log has opened, you'll see this window. And the view that we want is the frequency versus throttle view. So what we're going to do is we're going to go up to this overlay section and turn on the analyzer. We're going to select gyro scaled or raw gyro or pre-filtered gyro, depending on what version of uh, Betaflight you're using. And you should see a little kind of green plot like this. We'll full screen that. And then we're going to go up to here where it says frequency and we're going to select frequency versus throttle. And you should see this sort of red and black plot. And that's what we're going to be looking at when we talk about tuning our filters. This plot is the one that we want to look at. You can adjust the frequency scale using this slider. So you can kind of zoom in in frequency. Um, I'm going to leave it fully zoomed out because this shows up to 1000 hertz as it is. And then this bar is going to show you the luminosity of the graph. So you can increase or decrease the luminosity to make things more clear. Um, you kind of want it so that you can see all the features, but not so that it's all super white and blown out. You kind of want want it nicely exposed so you can see all the key features. And this is the plot that we're going to be using moving forward to tune our filters. In this video, we're going to be going through all of these different sections of the filter settings tab. You can find this in the PID tuning section in Betaflight Configurator. We're going to be going through the gyro low pass filters first, followed by the RPM filters, the dynamic notch filters, then the D-term low pass filters, and finally the yaw low pass filter. In this video, we are not going to be covering gyro notch filters or D-term notch filters because these static notch filters have been pretty much completely replaced by RPM filters and dynamic notch these days, and they're just in there for legacy. So I wouldn't suggest that you use them. We're going to focus on the parts of the filter settings that you should be using. 
If you love deep dive educational videos like this one, then please help me make more of them. You can support me directly on Patreon, where you'll get access to the entire Betaflight 4.5 tuning guide in PDF format, so you can work through it as you're tuning up your own quad. Or you can support me through Buy Me A Coffee, YouTube, all the usual ways. However you choose to, I really appreciate all of the support, and it may seem like a small amount to you, but it goes a long, long way. Thank you so much, and now on with the video. Now it's time to enable expert mode. In the Betaflight configurator, at the top, you'll find this black bar with a little tick box for expert mode. So go ahead and tick that, and that's gonna enable some settings and also allow us to move some sliders a bit further than we would otherwise. The first section we're going to look at are the gyro low pass filters. And you can see that we have two low pass filters here, gyro low pass 1 and gyro low pass 2. Gyro low pass 1 is disabled by default. There have been so many filters added to Betaflight over the years that this gyro low pass 1 is no longer required on most builds, so it's disabled by default and you should leave it disabled. Gyro low pass 2 is a particularly interesting filter because it's primarily an anti-aliasing filter. Now, if you are running a gyro rate that is different from your PID loop rate, so you're running 8K gyro, 4K PID loop, there is a risk of aliasing, where high frequency noise above 4 kHz gets aliased down and appears at lower frequencies and affects the PID loop. To avoid that, gyro low pass 2 is an anti-aliasing filter. So it is running at the gyro rate and it's filtering the gyro before it gets to the PID loop to remove those high frequency uh, signals. Needless to say, this is set by default to 500 Hz. That is far too low. For the vast majority of builds, you can push that gyro low pass 2 filter up much, much higher to 1 kHz or even more. So we're going to do that. We're going to take our gyro filter multiplier and slide it all the way to the right, and that will raise gyro low pass 2 to a cutoff frequency of 1 kHz. That's going to be plenty to do anti-aliasing and reduces the delay quite a bit. If your gyro rate is equal to your PID loop rate, so you're running 8K, 8K, or 3.6K, 3.6K, then you aren't going to have any aliasing because your gyro rate and PID loop rate are the same. In this case, you can safely disable gyro low pass 2. You don't need it. Um, but if you are in doubt, so you're not sure if your gyro rate is equal to your PID loop rate, then there's no harm in leaving gyro low pass 2 enabled with a cutoff of 1000 Hz. The next section that we're going to be looking at are the RPM filters. Now, motor noise is the main source of noise for most quads. You've got four motors spinning with props on. They're all going to be slightly unbalanced, and that's going to be producing a lot of vibration at the frequency at which the rotors spin. This motor noise is best handled by RPM filtering, and the noise typically starts around 100 hertz. So you know, around here, you can see it start to come in and increases with throttle and increasing frequency as well. So as we increase the throttle, the frequency of the noise and its intensity goes up. And you can see that I've kind of marked it on this, uh, on this chart here. There are often harmonics as well of the fundamental frequency. So when you've got a three-bladed prop spinning, it shouldn't surprise you that you also get some uh, noise at three times the RPM because every time the blade passes over the arm, it's going to create a bit of vibration, that sort of thing. And you can see that in the log as well. So we have the main motor noise here, a second harmonic, which is much quieter, and a third harmonic, which is quieter but still visible. And this is why you typically have a configurable number of RPM filters up to three. If we look carefully at a plot of motor noise, you can see that the motor noise doesn't extend all the way down to zero hertz, but it finishes at well, in this case, about 150 hertz. In Betaflight 4.3, the devs implemented a feature to take advantage of this phenomenon, and it's called RPM filter crossfading. What it does is it fades the RPM filters in over a range of frequencies. So you can see here that we have an RPM filter minimum hertz of 100 hertz and a fade range of 50. And so that means that the filters fade in between 100 and 150 hertz. You can take advantage of this by looking at your log and seeing where your motor noise starts to become apparent. And you can fade the RPM filters in over that range so that they reach full strength by the time the motor noise becomes very strong. In this case, I've got the settings at default, so it's going to start at 100 and be at full strength by 150 hertz. 
But looking at this log, we could make a change and try fading in over 100 hertz so that the RPM filters reach full strength by 200 hertz because you know the noise doesn't get very strong until we get up to 200 hertz. This is something that you can experiment with and change, but the goal is to make sure that the filters have faded in enough to take care of the motor noise that's present at that frequency. The default settings are gonna be good for most five inch builds, but larger builds may want to start the RPM filter at a slightly lower frequency and fade it in more quickly. Smaller builds could take advantage and start the RPM filters at a higher frequency and take longer to fade them in. The second thing we can adjust with the RPM filters is the Q value. Now, RPM filters are notch filters, which means that they attenuate around a particular frequency. And how focused they are depends on the Q value. The higher the Q value, the tighter and more focused the notch, and the less delay that notch is gonna have. So all else equal, a higher Q value is gonna give you a better flying quad, provided that it's not letting noise through. The default Q value for the RPM filters is 500 in the CLI, but you can adjust it higher than that. I wouldn't recommend going higher than a Q value of about 1000, and you can just keep increasing that Q value and you just check in the logs to see where the motor noise is getting through. So you look at the log before filtering, so this is the raw gyro data, and then you look at the filtered gyro data on the same axis and go, well, is any motor noise getting through? If the answer is no, try increasing the RPM filter Q value. If you are starting to see motor noise getting through, then you might wanna move the Q value of the RPM filter down a little bit. As always, you wanna try and push the Q value as high as you can without uh, any noise getting through into the filtered gyro signal. The type of motor noise that you're gonna see in your logs is gonna depend a lot on the type of props that you're flying on the quad. If you're flying bi-blade props, you're likely to see some noise at the main motor RPM frequency, the fundamental frequency, and you're also gonna see a lot of noise, perhaps even more noise at twice that frequency, and then maybe some additional noise at three times and four times the fundamental frequency. Compare that to a tri-blade prop where you typically see the most noise at the main RPM frequency, the fundamental, almost no noise at the second at twice the fundamental frequency, and then some noise at three times the fundamental frequency, which you'd expect because three blades, therefore you're gonna get some noise at three times the frequency. This characteristic has allowed the Betaflight devs to implement a brand new feature for Betaflight 4.5, and that's called RPM filter dimming. What this allows you to do is to adjust the strength of each individual RPM filter harmonic so that it attenuates just the amount that you need and no more. And this helps reduce filter delay if you can turn down some of those filters. For three-bladed props, you're gonna see quite a bit of noise at the fundamental and nothing on the second motor harmonic and maybe a little bit on the third motor harmonic. So that means you can change the RPM filter weights in the CLI by setting set RPM filter weights 100 for the first RPM filter, zero for the second because we don't need it, we've not got any noise at that second motor harmonic, and 80 for the third to say we don't need such a strong filter on the, on the third harmonic because we've not got so much noise. For a bi-blade prop, I would suggest that you set the RPM filter weights, something like 180 zero is a, is a good thing to, to start with but you may also find that you need 100, 100, zero, or 100, 150. It all depends how strong each of these harmonics are. You can happily decrease the RPM filter weights as long as motor noise is not visible in the filtered gyro signals. And the more you decrease the RPM filter weights, the less delay you'll have in your filtering and the better the quad is gonna fly, provided that you aren't seeing noise getting through into the filtered gyro. With your RPM filters correctly configured, you're going to be able to eliminate the vast majority of motor noise. But there are other sources of noise that we need to take care of. And one of the main ones is frame resonance. You'll see frame resonances as vertical stripes in your black box log, and they'll occur at a particular frequency over a range of throttle values. Frame resonance is a really important source of noise, particularly for five inch and larger quads. If you're seeing um, stripes like this above about 100 hertz, then that's likely to be a frame resonance. 
If you see white stripes below 100 hertz, that's typically not the frame, unless it's a you have a particularly large quad. It might be something like an antenna or a GoPro mount that's causing that sort of vibration. So it's always worth checking over your quad before you start tuning it to make sure there's nothing flexible or wobbly that's going to create resonances at low frequencies. The number of dynamic notches that you need is going to be equal to the number of vertical stripes that you see in your black box log. And normally it's just the one that's the that you need some with some frames particularly larger frames you might see two or three in which case you're going to need two or three dynamic notches but for this log this is the Ishim wizard x220 it's just one stripe so i only need one dynamic notch it's important to say at this stage that not all quads require the dynamic notch filter so here we have a quad that definitely needs a dynamic notch filter you can see a big bright vertical stripe of frame resonance that we need to take care of and we're going to use the dynamic notch to take care of that. But if you have a very quiet frame, like this is the AOS 5 V5, you do not need the dynamic notch if your log looks like this. There is no vertical stripe of noise to take care of. The dynamic notch is going to be sitting there doing nothing and causing delay without giving you any benefit. So if you do have a nice quiet log and you don't see any bright vertical stripes, then you can safely disable the dynamic notch, save the filter delay, that will make your quad fly a little bit better, and you won't have any problem with noise because the dynamic notch wasn't needed. It's not doing anything anyway. The dynamic notch works by scanning for resonant noise across a range of frequencies, and that range is defined by the dynamic notch minimum and maximum frequency in the configurator. You're going to want to set your minimum dynamic notch frequency a little bit below your first frame resonance that you can see. And ideally, you want to set it to uh, more than 150 hertz and definitely more than 100 hertz because you don't want the dynamic notch hunting down to very low frequencies because it's going to have nasty effects on flight performance. It's going to add a lot of delay. So for this log here, I would probably set my minimum dynamic notch frequency to maybe 200 hertz because that's about 25 hertz below the main kind of bulk of the noise. For the maximum dynamic notch frequency, this is really not so critical because the dynamic notch, it doesn't really care how high up in frequency it hunts. If it goes to a higher frequency, it's just going to cause less delay, so it's not a problem. I would leave the default, that's typically okay, around 600 hertz. But if you wanted the dynamic notch to be more focused and to improve its resolution, you could bring that down a bit. You could say on this log, maybe 300 hertz would be a perfectly reasonable upper bound for the dynamic notch, as long as you're happy that it, it's not going to hunt for noise outside of that range from about 200 to 300 hertz. Similar to the RPM filters, the dynamic notch also has a Q factor, and increasing that Q factor makes the notch filter tighter, more focused, and it reduces its delay. You can continue to increase the Q factor of the dynamic notch as long as the frame resonance that it's targeting is not creeping through into the filtered gyro data. So you're going to increase that Q factor and as you make the notch tighter and tighter, eventually noise is going to escape on either side of it. And once that happens, you're going to see that visible in the filtered gyro data, then just reduce the Q factor back down a little bit. But you want that Q factor as high as you can get it whilst the dynamic notch is still taking care of all of that frame resonance. In general, I would recommend that you don't increase the Q factor much above a thousand, as at that point the dynamic notch really is getting so tight that it's going to miss frame noise either side of the center of the notch. Now we've tuned our RPM filters to remove motor noise, and we've tuned our dynamic notch filters to remove any frame resonances, or if there aren't any frame resonances, we've switched off the dynamic notch but we still have a lot of remaining noise that we need to take care of. And that's because the D term in the PID loop amplifies high frequency noise. Twice the frequency is twice the gain when it comes to the D term. So we can't leave any high frequency noise unfiltered or it's just gonna explode in the D term. We take care of all of this remaining noise using the D term low pass filtering. With D term low pass filtering in Betaflight 4.5, there are a couple of different approaches that you can use. And I wanna run through both of them here. We've got the Karate filter tune, which is the default in Betaflight with two PT1 filters. This gives you a nice balance of delay and attenuation. 
We also have my AOS tune, which uses a single dynamic biquad filter. This is a more aggressive filtering approach. It gives you slightly less delay of useful signals and slightly better rejection of motor noise, particularly at high throttle. So it's worth comparing the two and picking which one is right for you. When we're thinking about filtering approaches, what we care about is delay and attenuation. We want the minimum possible delay of useful signals and the maximum attenuation of motor noise. Useful signals in flight are up to about 90 hertz. That includes movements of the quad and prop wash. So we really care about the phase delay of those useful signals. We can see that the karate tune in blue here at 0% throttle versus the AOS tune in brown at 0% throttle, the AOS tune has slightly less delay of useful signals. So that's gonna give you slightly better prop wash handling. If we then look at motor noise, what we care about with motor noise is the attenuation of the motor noise. We want the motor noise to be reduced as much as possible. And if we look at the 100% throttle curves here, we can see that the AOS tune has a bit more attenuation of motor noise than the karate tune. So it's giving you a little bit more reduction, particularly at high throttle levels, which is when motor noise is most prevalent. If we think about the uh, attenuation of useful signals, we don't want to attenuate useful signals. We want to carry those flight movements in that prop wash through to the filtered gyro with as little change as possible. You can see that the karate tune, particularly at low throttle, does attenuate these useful signals somewhat, whereas the AOS tune does a lot less attenuation. So in general, the AOS tune is gonna give you a little bit better response to prop wash. It's gonna give you a little bit better rejection of motor noise. And so this would be the one that I would recommend, um, but there's nothing wrong with the default karate tune and it's a little bit more forgiving if your quad has uh, not such a nice quiet noise profile. To show you what I mean, I've put the two filters over the top of a black box log so we can kind of see how they play off against each other. The useful signals here are going to be attenuated less by the AOS tune. So you see the AOS tune in gold here goes a little bit higher, the karate tune attenuates more. So that's gonna reduce the, the, useful, uh, the useful signals getting through if you're using karate. Then we have this region here, and this is a region where the karate tune is attenuating more and the AOS tune is attenuating less. So if you have a lot of noise in this area of your black box log, so between, um, let's say, 50 and 150 hertz, the karate tune is gonna probably do a better job of attenuating that noise for you. The AOS tune is gonna let more of it through. So depending on how quiet this region is, that's gonna push you to pick one or the other. When we get to the motor noise, you see the AOS tune again has better attenuation of motor noise. So in this big peak here where we have a lot of motor noise, the AOS tune is doing more attenuation. So that's gonna be helping to reduce that noise, reduce the amount of noise getting through to the gyro. The Karate filters are slightly easier to tune because you can use the filter slider to tune the cutoff frequencies. So with Karate, if you want to tune the D-term, all you need to do is slightly increase this D-term filter multiplier, 0 0.05, 0 0.1 at a time, and just nudge that up until you start getting rough sounding motors or hot motors, and then you just turn it down a bit. You can also look at black box logs to see how much noise is making it through the D-term filtering. With the AOS D-term tune, it's a little bit more complicated to tune because you can't use the slider. So you have to turn off the profile dependent filter settings. That will disable this D-term slider. And then you're gonna change the D-term low pass filter to 80, 110, 7, and biquad type. And that's gonna then set you up with the AOS tune. To tune the AOS filters, you just need to increase the minimum cutoff frequency until you hear oscillations at zero throttle and then you turn it back down a little bit. Then you increase the maximum cutoff frequency until you start hearing oscillations at full throttle and then you turn it back down a little. So you do the kind of the tuning in two stages. So you tune for zero throttle and then you tune for full throttle and that makes sure that you have the minimum filter delay across the whole range of throttle settings. The final setting you need to be aware of when tuning your D-term low pass filters is the Dynamic Curve Expo. This controls how fast the dynamic filter changes frequency. So 
what we've done is we've set a minimum cutoff frequency, which is going to be the cutoff frequency at zero throttle, and we've set a maximum, which is the cutoff frequency at full throttle. But how are the cutoffs going to move between those two? If you have a setting of five in Dynamic Curve Expo, then it's just a linear change. The filter cutoffs increase linearly with increasing throttle. Higher numbers than five are more aggressive, so the cutoff increases more quickly at low throttle and then it increases more slowly as you get towards full throttle. And that's going to decrease the filter delay that you experience at low to mid throttle. Once you've found the correct maximum and minimum frequency from testing at full throttle and zero throttle respectively, just try increasing that dynamic curve expo and see how high you can push it up before you start hearing oscillations in around the mid throttle region. The higher number that you can achieve without getting any oscillations or any noise coming through in the black box logs, the lower the filter delay that you're going to achieve. The final filter to talk about is the Yaw Low Pass filter. And this is actually a gyro filter, but it only applies to the Yaw axis. And the reason for this is that the Yaw axis responds very much more slowly than either pitch or roll, because Yaw is controlled by the change in angular momentum of the motors and the props, rather than changes in thrust, which can flip the quad very, very much more quickly. Filter delay on Yaw is therefore very much less of a concern than filter delay on pitch and roll, again, because you, that axis is responding very much more slowly. Reducing noise on the yaw axis can sometimes help allow a tighter tune on pitch and roll because if you have noise coming through the yaw axis and going into the motors, that heats the motors up a bit and reduces the headroom that you've got on pitch and roll for noise on those axes before the motors get too hot. So you're sort of, you reduce the noise on yaw to provide more headroom on pitch and roll. There's nothing sacrosanct about this yaw low pass filter. If you're someone who's looking for maximum responsiveness, particularly on the yaw axis, you might want to try turning it off and seeing if that provides an improvement in your black box logs. And with that, we've covered all of the settings you need to know about to get a perfect filter tune in Betaflight 4.5. I've got follow-up videos coming covering PIDs and rates, so make sure you're subscribed so you see those as soon as they come out. And if you appreciate educational videos like this and you'd like to support me and the work I'm doing and get some really nice perks, then please consider joining my Patreon or supporting me directly through Buy Me A Coffee. There are links to both of those down in the video description. That's all I have for you for today. So until next time, I wish you all very, very happy flying.